All right. Hey, hi, and hello, everyone. Anthony Fantano here, the Internet's busiest music nerd. I hope you are doing well. We return with a very familiar series on this channel. I go over the top 10 tracks according to Billboard for a given year, and I uh, rank those from S tier to F tier, depending on how I personally feel about the tracks myself. In this episode, we are going back to the fall off year of 1999. We are doing the 90s. We've done the 2000s. We've done the 2010s. Why stop there? Especially given just how much musical magic was happening during the decade where I was a kid, a child, an adolescent. So without any further ado, let's get into these tracks, starting with number 10 on Billboard's list over here, Ricky Martin's Live in La Vida Loca. Oh my God. You know, the 90s, it's kind of a funny time because in the mainstream, there were moments that were like considered to be Latin waves. It was nothing compared to what you see today in terms of like a very consistent presence of a diverse roster of Latin artists on the chart today. No, back then there were just like kind of a couple of uh, key artists leading the charge, Ricky Martin being one of them. And it's kind of funny going back and listening to this track and sort of seeing it uh, be considered as a part of a Latin wave at the time because it just sounds so fucking bland and gentrified. I mean, what exactly about the track musically and aesthetically feels Latin? I suppose a bit of the percussion, maybe the horns to an extent, though I could see uh, something with this style of brass working over a myriad of, of, of different types of songs. And um, also, I, I suppose, the fucking 007 style guitar solo. I mean, for sure, the influences are there to some extent, but they feel so uh, subtle and they feel so low key in order to make this track pop off with an audience that isn't usually, you know, used to listening to pop from anywhere outside of America. And look, none of this is Ricky Martin's problem or even uh, something that works against the song per se. It's still a catchy track. It's still a pop banger. It just goes to show how much a Latin track needed to be kind of neutered aesthetically and instrumentally in order for it to appeal to very American and very white audiences at the time. I mean, while Spanish language music today, if it is to hit over here, still has some expectations it needs to conform to in terms of like modern production, often uh, trap music uh, ends up being the backbone for some of the percussion on these tracks when you're talking about uh, artists like Bad Bunny, for example. But yeah, what Ricky brought us on this track just kind of feels like a slightly zesty party anthem with a story about a woman who uh, you're attracted to. She's alluring, she's sexy, she's exciting, but she's also dangerous. Maybe too dangerous to like uh, write a song about as in one lyric, uh, he says, that uh, she wants to slip him a sleeping pill. I don't know. It's kind of fun. It's kind of catchy. And it's also kind of sketchy. Uh, I would put this over in uh, the the C-Row. We're putting it in the C-Row. Okay, following this, uh, we have a track that I, I actually don't even recall uh, that clearly from this year. Deborah Cox is nobody supposed to be here. But that doesn't mean we can't go back and listen to it and make uh, an assessment regardless. You know what? Uh, damn, damn if this track's not fire. fire. Holy shit. And I do mean holy because there are some big gospel vibes coming off the uh, vocals and instrumentation on this cut. And Deborah Cox's lead vocals are incredible. She is soaring on this track. She's passionate. She's fiery. She's everything a singer should be. It's just a powerful performance all around. Maybe a little by the numbers for the lane that it inhabits, but it is still a killer track. And I'm glad that uh, uh, I was able to connect with it uh, by listening to it for this video. I'm putting this over in the A row. This, uh, this rules. This kicks ass. Okay, next uh, we are going to get a bit silly with it. Uh, Sugar Ray, Every Morning. Now, look, um, Sugar Ray, they are banned. I don't want to spend too much time explaining Sugar Ray, okay? All I will say is uh, they had some hits back in the day, 
And, uh, it, you know, every morning was not one of the better ones, in my opinion. Not just because the lyrics of the song make uh, the lead singer, Mark, uh, seem like more of a douchebag than he already kind of comes off to be. But the instrumental is annoying as hell, especially uh, around these uh, weird, washed out, echo drenched chorus parts. And it's songs like this that I can't really listen to or imagine somebody listening to and enjoying it without having this look on their face. I feel like because I have a mustache, I'm not able to fully do this, like, this, this, this look justice. Yeah, that's the vibe I get off this track. It's, um, frankly, uh, kind of gross. I, I would put it in the, uh, uh, the E row for every morning. <laughs> okay, next on the list, we have, uh, Christina Aguilera with uh, Genie in a Bottle, Christina's big breakout hit. If you guys remember back in 1999, that was like the year where uh, you had this new wave of pop divas breaking. Britney broke this year. Christina broke this year. And while I understand Christina is uh, one of the best, if not the best vocalist to come out of this you know, wave as far as the mainstream is concerned, I just don't really think this is a great song. I mean, there are some impressive vocal riffs and passages here and there, don't get me wrong. But beyond that, the production is just kind of okay. It's punchy and it's bassy and doesn't really have a whole lot of flavor beyond that. On top of it, I can't really stand the songwriting. I don't really mind that the track is like sensual or sexual in a way that is painfully obvious, but I just hate that we're sitting on the fence in this way where what the song is about and what it's saying is just so damn on the nose. And yet by that same token, literally every damn lyric is a fucking innuendo of some sort. And it's like, okay, I get it. Like you, you want this guy, you're horny. Just like, just say, say it. Social and artistic limitations of the nineties be damned. What's weird is like with all of this nudging and with all this winking, uh, what's being said on the track somehow feels grosser than just kind of coming out and saying the thing. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm going to put this over in uh, the, the, the D row. Okay. Following this next, uh, we have uh, Sixpence None the Richers, Kiss Me, which uh, actually is an amazing song. I love this tune. It's a great ballad. It is cute, 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 cute. Lyrics are solid. Guitar parts are great. Overall vibe is just intoxicating. It is a tender, pure, sweet little song with a flawless structure, heartening lyrics and vocals. Honestly, no notes. And it's a, you know, really solid example of, of the jangle pop underground uh, kind of peeking, you know, up into the charts here and there. The only note is that Sixpence None the Richer is a horrible band name and, uh, for sure contributed greatly to the fact that um, I always knew this song and knew it by title, but um, uh, could never ever recall the band name for much of my adult life. Regardless though, uh, I'm gonna put this over in the, uh, the S row. It rules, it's amazing. It's stellar. Okay, next on the list, it's the big one, the big B. The queen herself creeping in, it's Britney Spears with her big breakout hit, Baby One More Time, which uh, is maybe titled that because the whole hit me thing is, uh, it's, it's a bit much. But still, with that being said, uh, as far as mainstream 2000s uh, girl pop goes, this is perfection. Doesn't really get much better than this. And sure, while there's a lot of things I could say about Britney and her career and her creativity and her trajectory over uh, the length of time since this song came out. I don't want to do that. I would much rather look at this song in a vacuum, especially since, again, it was her first big breakout single. So there was really nothing anybody had to kind of gauge it by as we went into it. The track just won off of a combination of a great pop production, the beat, the heavy bassy piano, notes. Da -na -na. Everything about this track was groovy, danceable, catchy, high drama. Meanwhile, Britney herself uh, held it down vocally. If I have anything to add beyond here, uh, it doesn't really have so much to do with Britney as much as it has to do with uh, society obsessing over her in such an unhealthy way past 
this point. And as a result, Brittany really getting like the short end of the fucking stick, to put it lightly. Still, at the end of the day, uh, this track hit at the time for a reason and has withstood the test of time uh, for a reason that goes beyond Britney's uh, cultural appeal because just the music itself is, is great. It's just good quality pop. And for that reason, I'm going to put this uh, over in the S row, uh, otherwise known as the SRO. Okay, number four on Billboard's list is a, a late era Whitney hit, uh, Heartbreak Hotel, with Faith Evans and Kelly Price. Uh, this one actually kind of needed a bit of a, uh, a refresher on, because while there are some highly memorable vocal licks on this track for sure, I just never really found it to be that catchy of a song in general. On top of this thing not really being a strong song in and of itself, uh, this track kind of feels like Whitney playing catch up with the new era of R&B production and artists. And even with her bringing vocals that arguably smoked a lot of the much younger competition, um, this track just didn't really quite feel like her in terms of energy, in terms of sound, in terms of uh, even performance to an extent, because while her singing on the track is great, it does feel almost like she's holding back a bit to fit into the lane that is expected for this uh, new wave of very digital R&B at the time. Plus, honestly, that kind of like breathy Heartbreak Hotel intro <laughs> on the whole track is kind of awful. Yeah, at the end of the day, I, I just think this one is a uh, is kind of okay, even if it was a massive hit at the time. I'm putting it in the C row. Now, as far as pop and R&B goes uh, from this era, I feel like Monica's a angel of mine is a lot more like it. While it's not the boldest instrumental or vocal performance out there that you'll find uh, in this genre, this for me is a much more perfect representation of the form that uh, you know these songs operated in for the time. For that reason, I could put it uh, pretty handily in the B row. Getting closer to the end here is TLC's No Scrubs. Gonna be honest, back in the day, was a bit of a TLC fan, loved my crazy, sexy, cool tape. While I wasn't uh, as much of a fan of the, uh, you know, fan mail era uh, of the trio's career, No Scrubs was a bop and certainly an exception. And I think in terms of this, like, era of R&B, uh, an even better representation of the sound, and it's attached uh, to uh, better vocal performances and harmonies, as well as a pretty iconic uh, set of verses and, uh, you know, a narrative, a character portrait, a story going on as far as like, you know, uh, scrubs, what a scrub is, how the ladies in TLC don't want no scrubs. It's a form, it's a description that has withstood the test of time and has made this track one of the most just memorable R&B songs ever because the track goes the extra mile to try to define, to encapsulate something uh, in a way that often a lot of mainstream songs don't or they'll often just try to put their own spin on the same story over and over like, oh, uh, I'm in love. Here's my spin on a love song about me being in love. TLC here, conversely, they're not in love, especially, especially not, not with this scrub guy. guy. And they're gonna tell you exactly fucking why. They're cool, they're confident, they're sexy, they're not impressed. And this track is going right up here in the freaking S row. Then finally to close up shop, uh, Billboard's number one song for 1999 is uh, Cher's Believe, a track that is also uh, pretty much one of the most iconic and memorable songs of the 90s and I think represents a lot for dance pop at the time in terms of it um, showing us what was to come down the pipe for the genre and being kind of cutting edge in terms of its uh, very glitzy, punchy beats and share really going crazy, letting the auto tune just totally take over her voice to the point where it's making her uh, runs and embellishments on the track sound a bit, you know, warbly. Coming across a bit robotic on the track too. And, uh, you know, while I do kind of understand aesthetically what the song represents and kind of the ground that it was breaking at the time. Uh, kind of the other edge to that sword is that often, you know, music that kind of uh, takes the leap uh, with this sort of stuff uh, first and is uh, in a way like the canary in the coal mine uh, can sometimes kind of sound dated as down the road this stuff often evolves and changes and uh, you know these uh, ideas are adopted in different ways that become uh, better trend 
trendy or more aesthetically sound. Meanwhile, in a way, Cher's Believe, as good as it is at its core as a song, uh, does come across a little dated. And Cher's vocals, I, I think, to an extent, do sound maybe a little silly. The beat does go off, and there are some things about the song I can certainly uh, appreciate. Uh, but I feel like I, I enjoy the track more for its cultural significance and its historical significance, uh, as opposed to, you know, something that I would like put on to kind of casually vibe to. Still, with that being said, I do uh, have all the respect in the world for it. I would probably put it uh, over in the B row. In fact, I am, and I'm going to leave it there. Those are my songs for 1999 top 10 billboard ranked and rated right there for you let me know what you think of this tier list where would you tier these tracks and i appreciate you guys uh watching over here next to my head is another video you can check out hit that up or the link to subscribe to the channel anthony fantano sugar ray uh, forever